Greetings and welcome to Saturday. It's Saturday in America. If you're old as I am, you remember it's morning in America, friends and neighbors. Anyway, it's not morning in America. America is going fucking batshit. But anyway, I want to talk about something that I've never actually talked about before, which is kind of strange. Oh, look, I'm doing accordion hands. Um, drummies, drumming and drummers. I was a drummer for like 15 years, I guess, 16 years, I don't know. At the end, I was playing jazz, and I was pretty good, but I wasn't good enough, so I quit. Or I, it kind of quit me, and I kind of moved into writing. But I want to talk about my favorite drummers, period, and why. And that starts with rock drummers, because originally I was a rock drummer. I was in a band. We played police covers. That was some hard shit to play, because, you know, Stuart Copeland was pretty great. But we had a lot of fun. We wrote a bunch of songs. One day, we even like sent a demo to a local label, and I wrote the press release for our demo. And the guy wrote back and said, oh, the music's kind of derivative, but that was a good press release. But anyway, um, let's start with the king of drumming and rock drumming, John Bonham, of course. I never really cared for the Zeppelin music that much. It didn't really embrace me. You know, these British guys doing heavy metal versions of the blues, but they were great, and John Bonham was an incredible drummer. You know, I wrote a book with a friend of mine, Donnie Marshall, called uh, Classic Rock Drummers, and we named 10 drummers. And um, I wrote, uh, and Donnie wrote out the charts for specific songs, and I had to describe the drumming, and John Bonham's drumming is very complex. None of it starts on the one. He starts on weird places and beats. He has unusual sticking patterns. He was really just so brilliant. And on top of it, that incredible pocket. So one of the great drummers. And on the other side of the pond, as they say, but very similar to me, was Jeff Baccaro. Uh, there's a, a video floating around Instagram right now of the end of one of the Toto songs, and there are drum breaks. And he plays a drum fill and a couple cymbal smashes, and they are so heavy. It could be John Bonham. His groove was so enormous, yet it could be very delicate and light, as it was in... Uh, uh, Rosanna. It's very, uh, very subtle what he played there and very innovative in a way, even though sort of also very simple, the idea of playing triplets. He called it the, uh, it was the pretty shuffle on top and the bow diddly beat on the bottom on the bass drum. But Piccaro played so many amazing sessions. I mean, there's no way to own all the sessions that guy played on. If you watch um, Sonny and Cher repeats from the 70s, he's on drums when he's like 18. You know, he probably got in without a union card because his father, Joe Piccaro, was well known in the L.A. Uh, scene. But man, I'll name just a few albums he's on where he's so brilliant. Obviously, Boz Skaggs, uh, Down To Then Left, I think it is, or Steely Dan, Katie Lied, which must be, was one of his greatest ones, Steely Dan, uh, Pretzel Logic. Uh, Steely Dan Gaucho. I did I did a piece once for Modern Drummer, The Drummers of Steely Dan. I interviewed him for the piece, and he explained how on the title track on Gaucho, the uh, Becker and Fagan had given up on the song. They couldn't get it to flow. You know, parts of it is in an odd meter, and uh, they were using Wendell. And so Becker and Fagan went home for the night, and Roger Nichols and Piccaro just stayed there and worked on the groove all night long to make it perfect to when Becker and Fagan came in, they had the basic rhythm track for Gaucho that we all know and love. Uh, you know, he's on Donald Fagan's um, uh, first solo album. He's on so many records, Valerie Carter's debut album. It just goes on and on. Uh, my, the brother of my ex-brother-in-law, David Bateau, who wrote a lot of hits for Seals and Crofts, he plays on his first album and it's so subtle. There's a song called Happy in Hollywood which is kind of a throwback to the 20s, but halfway through it, Bacara starts playing this sort of reggae groove, and this is about 1975 or something. And of course, all the brilliant Toto albums that he's on, man, he was just such an incredible player, such a deep pocket. He's on one of my favorite Sheffield Labs records, James Newton Howard and Friends, which audiophiles kind of laugh at now, but that's an incredible record for the grooves, for the pockets. Um, for the sound of his drums on that record. Anyway, Jeff Piccaro's great. Ringo Starr, of course, who, you know, I think if you watch, you know, I think it's pretty well realized now that Ringo Starr is one of the greatest drummers of all time. And it's interesting to watch uh, Peter Jackson's Let It Be uh, documentary, which is like nine hours long or something, because you see Ringo doesn't talk much while they're playing the songs. Ringo's listening and watching and concentrating and focusing, which goes against the idea of Ringo as this kind of jocular buffoon you know and when he's working on his drum tracks he is focused and he's listening and he's working on his parts and of course uh, he played on so many great uh, drum parts um 
from the early days of the Beeble, Beebles, the Beebles, like Baby, It's You, the Burt Bacharach song they covered, up through Day Tripper, of course, and Ticket to Ride with all the great fills, the rolls on the tom, and of course, his masterpiece, I think, which is Rain or Come Together. And Rain, um, I think they sped up the recording. But anyway, he's brilliant on that. You know, he was a left-handed guy playing a right-handed kid, so he came up with all these really unusual ideas, but Ringo had an amazing feel. And he was part of the magic of the Beatles. And the Beatles were, for years, I would watch them on videos and I would just think, these guys, this is magic. Because what they did was so incredible. Um, and you know, this guy sang in perfect harmony and they didn't have monitors back then. Anyway, so uh, Ringo Starr, uh, Charlie Watts, of course, who I think kind of sucked right up until um, Sticky Fingers. But if you listen to the intro of Honky Tonk Women, the way, he, the way he drops the groove in, dap, dum, psh, behind the beat, he starts out with that cowbell thing. The drums sound great. From that point on, he plays with fantastic grooves with great ideas and great subtlety. Uh, of course, B.J. Wilson, who played with Pearl Cole Heron, perhaps the most unsung rock drummer of all time, who had incredible chops, but they were purely at the service of the music. And he also came up with incredible ideas. Go listen to Joe Cocker's version of A Little Help With My Friends and you'll hear how amazing his ideas were. Or there's an, there's an, there's an amazing video on YouTube of Procol Harum playing, I um, can't remember the name song, the name is Goodbye. Ten, anyway, it's a long song on a German station and the amount, and the, the dynamics he plays with and the ideas and the way he would frame songs. I mean, listen to Whiskey Train by Procol Harum, any number of great, Procol Harum songs. He was incredibly intuitive, and the band called him the octopus in the bathtub because he sat, he sits very, very low on the kit, um, and so the toms are sort of in his face. Anyway, another great, great drummer. Also, other great rock drummers. Of course, we have funk drummers like Clyde Stubblefield and Jabbo Starks and Al Jackson, but that's a whole different world than the white rock drummers. They're, they were on totally different paths back then. Um, who are the other great rock drummers who I really enjoyed? Uh, Simon Kirk when he was in Free. I don't like the bad company stuff, but he was great in Free. There are many great rock drummers. And of course, perhaps my favorite, Jim Gordon. There's recently a book on Jim Gordon, which I should have written. I was a huge Jim Gordon fan for many, many, and many years, even though he killed his mother with a hammer. Um, he had beautiful technique. Uh, you can see him on his solo album, Hog Fat, where he's wearing a white turtleneck, kind of like a Buddy Rich thing. But he had beautiful ideas, an incredible pocket, which spans both hip hop, funk, and rock. He's played on the incredible Bongo Band record, which became one of the most sampled hip hop records of all time. And, you know, he's on endless rock hits. You know, the most obvious probably um, uh, Derek and the Dominoes. Uh, so let's switch to jazz drummers. Um, the first jazz drummer I was ever really, really taken with was Philly Joe Jones, because he's such a graceful player. He had beautiful ideas based on rudiments. And back then I was really into rudiments. And so he had beautiful rudimental ideas that just flowed around the kit. He, he could play any tempo, he could play any style within jazz, any subgenre of jazz. He had a great touch, he had an incredible swing feel. And his swing feel on the ride cymbal is sort of constant. He didn't break it up a lot, even though some drummers have told me that's not true. It was pretty always a ding, ding, da, ding, ding, da, ding, ding, da, ding, the dotted eighth idea of the drummers. That's the first thing you have to do is learn how to swing on a ride cymbal. And I could swing at the end of my career, but I always sounded very white to me. I didn't have any soul, but I had technique. But um, Philly Jojo had just amazing ideas. I mean, any number of great records he plays on, perhaps the most beautiful is Art Pepper meets the rhythm section. Of course, all the first great quintet from Miles, uh, those uh, late 50s era prestige records. Um, he's, on an, um, he's on Poor Game Best, Miles record, where it's just unbelievable what he does on that on that, even though there are mistakes in certain parts where he's taking breaks, what he's playing is so beautiful. You know, he's probably one of the most recorded jazz drummers of all time, one of the most recorded Blue Note drummers of all time. Um, also on Blue Note, you have to remember the great Kenny Clark. It took me a while to really appreciate Kenny Clark. Uh, but another guy with b beautiful technique. You know, there's a record he's on, uh, it's a classically oriented record, Rudy Van Gelder, I think it's on Vox where he plays like classical snare drum and percussion. He's, the guy had amazing technique. And I believe Kenny Clark is famous for perfecting the ride cymbal beat. Um, 
And, you know, he, he's one of those guys, his drumming is really, really timeless. If Kenny Clark arrived today and went to Smalls, he'd be totally in his idiom. His drumming is timeless, it's current, it's historical. He had a beautiful, beautiful touch. Along that same line, Joe Jones, who I believe perfected the, 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 uh, the ride cymbal beat, but on the hi-hat. Uh, Joe had incredible sense of humor. If you can find a copy of his record, The Drums, where he goes through all the great drummers that influenced him, that is an essential guide. Plus, it's beautifully recorded on a French label. And he has a very witty, jaunty, sophisticated way of speaking. He was a really colorful character. Of course, you can hear many, uh, many of the great early Count Basie records, but that record, The Drums, is the 3LP set. I believe Vogue is the label. It's just, you know, it's pure, utter mastery. Um, and he's probably self-taught, as were all the drummers. Before Berkeley arrived, I guess in the late 60s, everybody was self-taught. Now these schools turn out drummers like frickin' Twinkies, and they all come out with amazing technique. Today's jazz drummers have astounding technique. Um, but it's hard, you know, there's not a lot of... I mean, I like a lot of modern jazz. Emmanuel Wilkins is brilliant. Melissa Aldana, I love what she's doing. Some of the Joel Ross I really like. There's so many great players. But I think their music doesn't always translate to record. But seeing them live is a whole nother deal. I saw, I've seen Melissa Aldana a few times. I saw her at Dizzy's with my stereophile editor, Jim Austin, about a month ago. And man, that group is astounding. She has one of the greatest young drummers working today, Kush Abade. That guy is just on fire. He's fluid, he has brilliant ideas. He's lighthearted. A lot of the great jazz drummers, there's, there's, to me, there's a lightheartedness in their playing. Philly Joe Jones has it. Kenny Clark has it. Joe Jones has it. But then somebody like Jimmy Cobb doesn't have it. Jimmy Cobb's drumming, to me, is sort of, you know, he's got this pure swing groove, and it's kind of serious. He doesn't play a lot, but, man, his pocket is so simple and spare, and it, but it's really deep, but it's not lighthearted. Um, Shadow Wilson's another early uh, drummer who has a great sense of style, had a great vision of the drum set. Um, who else do I really love? There's so many great drummers, man. Mickey Roker, good God almighty. Mickey Roker is similar to Philly Joe Jones, but he may be even more witty and more inventive in a way. Mickey Roker played on a lot of Blue Note records, played on a lot of Stanley Turrentine records, which also makes me think of Al, Al Harewood, another guy similar to Jimmy Cobb that he played rather simply, but he played beautiful ideas. I mean, he really knew how to support Stanley Turrentine and Shirley Scott. Um, he plays on a lot of their records, Eddie Lockjaw Davis records, Al Harewood is brilliant. Oh, Mickey Roker, good Lord. Pick up, you know, or stream um, uh, Stanley Turrentine, Easy Walker. Mickey Roker is just, he's just hes just brilliant. So many beautiful ideas and a sense of humor. I interviewed Al Tootie Heath once, who I was not crazy about his drumming. We just lost him, even though his last couple solo records were really great. But apparently Al Tootie Heath and Mickey Roker were really good friends. And uh, Al would say that Mickey would always give me a hard time because he had more technique than I did. He'd laugh at me. But then he said, apparently, Mickey got a religion, and he was much nicer to him after that. Um, who are the other amazing drummers? Uh, there's so many great drummers in the free area. Han Benick, Bob Moses. Um, of course, we can't forget Buddy Rich or Gene Krupa. But Buddy Rich, you know, was a freak of nature. He knew he was a freak of nature. Uh, nobody has a better single stroke role. Nobody drives a big band better than Buddy Rich. I saw him in uh, Davidson College sometime in the early 80s with a big band, and he was heckling like an eight-year-old in the first row. It was like, what is going on here? It was like, it was bizarre. He was challenging the kid to come up and play drums, and they were like going back and forth. Man, was that weird. My buddy Rich was an incredible freak of nature. Um, Gene Krupa as well, uh, even though he didn't have the utter mastery that um, Buddy Rich had, I guess he had more charisma. But as far as... Uh, the great, great jazz drummers who I love. Freddie Waits is another one. Billy Hart, who is still with us. And Billy, you can, Billy has really evolved from his early days with people like Wes Montgomery uh, to be this kind of master of cymbal 
interplay and cymbal color and a beautiful touch on the drum set. Of course, he's on Bitches Brews on so many great records, which leads me to Lenny White, another uh, sort of really overlooked drummer in the jazz idiom because he made his name with a fusion group, Return to Forever. But his early records, uh, Joe Henderson, if you're not part of the problem, you're part of the solution, you know, whatever. Um, Bitches Brew, uh, he's done some Woody Shaw records. Lenny White had an incredible uh, skill set, great time feel, extremely unique. No one sounds like Lenny White, which he, you know, when he, it's funny, there, uh, you can hear early Return to Forever with, with Steve Gadd playing, who was the original drummer, but didn't want to do it because he wanted to stay in the money and uh, stay in the city and make money playing sessions. And it's like stiff as the fucking board. But when Lenny's playing those same songs, oh my God, Lenny was just a, a volcano. And of course, Lenny White leads to Jack DeJunette, perhaps today's greatest living jazz drummer. You know, Jack, wow, you know, you need to hear him on um, on that, uh, the Lost Fusion Band, or, you know, the band from the 70s with Miles that never recorded with Chick Corea and Dave Holland and the other guys. Uh, I mean, he's just... He's incredible, it was only, and he's also incredible playing straight ahead. If you listen to him with, on these early on these Keith Jarrett records from the '80s, like Still Live, uh, he just plays perfect straight ahead. He's on so many records. One of my favorites is Dave Holland Triplicate with Steve Coleman. They're playing trio, and Jack is just just a marvel. He's also incredible on a lot of ECM records. So many records. His early ECM records, which are still out of print, he's wonderful on those. Jack had a great sense of articulation. He had a great sense of what I think he called multi-directional drumming. Uh, there was so much happening within the rhythm while he was playing the drums. He's looting so many things. He had a beautiful touch. His cymbal sound is very, very unique. Um, who are the other great guys? Great cats from the uh, 70s because most of the great jazz drummers are from the 50s up through the late uh, 70s. There are a lot of great jazz drummers today. Ulysses Owens, uh, Jonathan Barber, Antonio Sanchez, who's not really a jazz drummer, um, but you know, can play jazz. Uh, Bill Stewart may be the greatest of the most recent crop, but a lot of these guys, like Kush Abade, have so much technique. Rodney Green, Gregory Hutchinson, another great drummer. Um, you know, a lot of these guys came up like Kenny Washington. They came through Betty Carter's group. And I was told that Betty Carter would always start the set with the fastest song of the night. Can you imagine the hell that puts a drummer through? But Kenny Washington, um, you know, Kenny's great because he's like a, a streamlined version of, of uh, Philly Joe Jones. He's almost, you know, if you talk to Kenny about jazz, he'll say, I don't like that popcorn stuff. He's very serious uh, and he's an audiophile. Um, but Kenny has a great touch, great ideas, a beautiful swing feel. Um, he plays with Bill Sharlap now, where I think his talents are rather diminished in that group, he, but he can play anything. And of course, you can't make any list about the greatest jazz drummers, or really the greatest drummers of all time, without including Roy Haynes, who must be close to 100 now and is obviously still with us. He lives in Baldwin, New York, about an hour's train ride from New York City. I've interviewed him a couple of times out there. Um, once, uh, it's just a standalone interview for a, uh, for a modern drummer story. Then I interviewed him with Lewis Nash as a co-late leaders uh, modern drummer cover story, which neither one of them was happy about. And then the last time I interviewed him, I sort of just recorded it and interjected questions while Terry Lynn Carrington and Jack DeJunet did the main questioning. And we did the interview down in Jack's uh, basement with its uh, leopard skin patterns everywhere, which is kind of funny. And when you go up, when you use his bathroom, he has a toilet seat that's plexiglass and it's full of nickels and on the back of the toilet seat it says the buck stops here or the nickel stops here or something like that whatever neither here nor there i had a friend over today and we were listening to uh mccoy tyner reaching forth which features roy in a trio with henry grimes and his drumming is just so you know witty and you know ceaselessly inventive and so original and unique he makes such a commentary on everything and he I, I don't know where he came from. I think he's totally original. You can't follow the lineage. I mean, he started drumming, you know, back in, with Charlie Parker and before that. So uh, who was he into? I don't know. Obviously, Max Roach, most likely. 
but um, his drumming is so streamlined and he has an amazing time feel on the ride cymbal, the way he would work the hi-hat in. He didn't always play a constant two and four on the hi-hat and just an amazing sense of space and openness. And his snare drum accents were like a, like a boxer. The closest analogy I can think of in, in a contemporary drummer would be Bill Stewart, who seems to play out of uh, Roy Haynes' uh, bag of tricks. And um, Roy had an amazing cymbal sound. He kind of pioneered the flat ride sound and a great snare drum sound, great attack. And he shows up on the strangest records. Um, like I found him on an Edda Jones record. He's obviously on Blues and the Abstract Truth by Oliver Nelson. He's on Now He Sings, Now He Sobs by Chick Corea. He made his own great records out of the afternoon as one of the great impulse records. Um, and he's just a real force of nature. And you can spot him a mile away because he's got such an, his, the way he accents phrases and plays on the snare drum and on the entire kit, it's kind of erratic. It's kind of cubist in a way. He goes against the grain of, of, of drumming now and then, and he sounds totally contemporary. Speaking of Roy Haynes, of course, one of the great masters, and I will posit that he was actually more complex in what he played than Elvin Jones. Elvin always had that thunderous rolling triplet sound and that raw power and aggression and the way he slammed the kit, the way he interacted with, with Coltrane. Um, and if you listen to the, uh, I forgot what it's called exactly, but there's a time when Elvin was out and Roy Haynes took his place on some live performances with Train, and it's entire the the levels are entirely reset for each musician. Train seems bigger and louder, and Roy is playing much more of the air of the drum set and less of the bottom and the rolling thunder of it, because his thing is very much from the snare drum up, as where uh, Elvin's thing was really the full set. But the cymbals were just another thing he sort of bashed as he was crashing and rolling on the entire set, the toms and the bass drum. As Roy is more above it all, he's a real intellectual in the way he plays, and his sense of swing is really popping and light and airy. Anyway, one of the greats. And to veer off of that, that strain a little bit, you then have someone like Paul Motion, who began, you know, Paul made his name with uh, Bill Evans, and Bill Evans' classic trio, classic trio with Scott LaFaro, but he left at the height of that fame because he was tired of it. He'd had enough of that. And he left and came back to New York to play with uh, Paul Blay. Again, sort of a cubist in the way he played piano. Very unusual phrasing. Sort of like Roy Haynes to a degree. A very erudite, cerebral approach to his instrument. Not to say that he wasn't swinging or funky. The same thing you can say about Roy Haynes. But Paul Blay had a different approach to playing jazz piano, which you can then later be heard in someone like Keith Jarrett, I believe. But you have Paul Motion playing, I mean, just beautiful phrases, simple, the classic swing trio with Bill Evans. Then he goes to Paul Blay. Then he does a lot of session work. Then he becomes a mainstay on EM, EMT, not EMT, that's a turntable company, on a Black Saint Soul Note, and then on ECM as a leader then later with Bill Frizzell and Joe Lovano and their amazing trio. And by that point, by the end of his life, his drumming is totally different than when he started out. He is playing more toms, more open fills. He's playing much louder. Paul Motion almost sounded like a, a child at the end of his life when he played drums. And there was a real sense of freedom there. And he always swung incredibly hard. And from Motion, sort of to my way of thinking, some people probably wouldn't agree with this, but I think that extends the real free drummers like Rashid Ali, Milford Graves, Sonny Murray. Then you have Sonship Theus, who didn't play very long, but was really important in the fusion scene in the early 70s. But Ali, you know, very no, another guy who played with Train and played amazing duets with Train. I think it's Interstellar Space, I think, is the, basically the, the duo album between Coltrane and Rashid Ali. You know, and he, again, is very different from... Elvin, but he's not like Roy Haynes. He's still very meaty and powerful and and more of a of a tonal drummer in that way. Milford Graves, you know, I've often said, people are probably tired of this, Milford Graves kind of reminds, he's like the Keith Moon of jazz. I saw Milford play a few times, I, and I saw Keith Moon play once. I'm actually old enough to have seen him play with The Who in the early 70s when I was uh, too young to attend concerts, but a friend, his mother was a security guard, so we got in concert three. But 
both Milford and Keith Moon, what they played on the set is not what you actually heard coming off the set. They were like magicians in a way. It was like sleight of hand. And Milford was a real force of nature. His drums, by conventional standards, really didn't sound very good. Um, he was using, I think, no bottom heads in the early days, long before anybody else did, perhaps because he came out of more of a Latin percussion background. I think that's correct. But Milford just, wow, just a, a giant waves and waves of sound coming from all parts of his kit. Um, all these unusual sticking techniques, the way he would play the kit, the, the way he would tune the kit. He was a real original. And just now, in the past year or so, have we seen the reissue of some of Milford's classic records. There's that record, which I don't think was ever out before, with Arthur Doyle called Children of the Forest, which was recorded at some loft in Soho. Um, and then Namo with Bill Pullen. I mean, Don Pullen has been reissued. Bobby, an early Milford record, I believe, in his own label. And then uh, some other record. But three or four of Milford's prime records have been released. Plus, he's on early SP records. I think he's on Spiritual Unity with uh, Albert Eiler, and he's just, he was just an amazing, um, cerebral, intellectual, you know, primal force on the drums. And again, like Roy Haynes, to a degree, totally, totally natural. And then if we get more into like rock guys and funk guys, to me, the masters are people like Zigaboo Motoleste from the Meters, Bernard Purdy, of course. And one of the modern drummers who I think is really, really fantastic, who has nothing to do with any of these guys is Matt Gartska from Animals as Leaders, who to me are the greatest progressive rock band on the earth today. And Gartska is, uh, you know, really earthy, really inventive. He has a trademark sound, uh, a really beautiful drum style. Um, Animals as Leaders <clears throat> are, are just a tremendous band. They, uh, their guitar player, I think, plays guitar and bass at the same time. They have two guitarists and one drummer. And man, they're just too much. But anyway, I hope you like my overview of jazz drumming, drumming, rock drumming, jazz drumming, and jazz rock drumming. Thanks for watching. Please uh, like and subscribe. Bye.